Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, also from, uh, from this panel. Welcome to uh, M&A. Welcome back to the real world. I feel a uh, um, little bit in between being scared and feeling like a dinosaur um, at the age of 50. Um, I was thinking when, when I heard what Frau Hofstetter said, I thought, okay, what can we do about it? And the only, uh, the very simple solution that Stefan came up with was uh, just pull the plug from your computer and use your pen. That may help for a while, but um, we'll, we'll see how this will develop. Um, we want to um, talk about uh, M&A, um, fundraising, deals, M&A environment. And I'm very delighted to have uh, such a esteemed panel here, and I'll, I'll uh, introduce you to um, Jessica. Jessica is a private equity lawyer from McFarland's. You, I'm sure uh, most of you have heard of McFarland's. is one of the leading uh, law firms in the United Kingdom that is involved in private equity, and Jessica is one of their... Uh, most prominent private equity lawyers. She works for uh, private equity sponsors and also for management teams. She does domestic but uh, also a lot of cross-border transactions. I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that you're on the Brexit committee, so <laughs> uh, that seems to be in good hands. Um, and uh, she's considered in, in the UK as one of uh, England's female private equity stars and uh, female deal stars, if I may say that. On the right of Jessica is Dr. Gernot Eisinger. Um, Gernot, he is a, a fund manager with um, Afino. He's actually one of the founders of Afino. I'm sure uh, a lot of people here know him. Um, they've started up uh, Afino in 2000 and they're currently with their eighth fund um, with, uh, that you've just closed with a volume of 410 million euros. You invest in majorities but would also consider minority investments purchase prices between 10 and 150 million euros. You're investing in the Dach region and you're, um, one, you're, you're the representative, say, for the, for the mid-market, if I, if I may yeah. say so. Mid-market mid dinosaur is too. Yeah. A, a mid-market dinosaur, <laughs> mid-cap dinosaur, okay. Eight funds since 2000, that means every second year a new fund. Six, six right? funds. Six, six funds. funds. There were two with two parallel vehicles, so it's six funds. Not bad, yeah, not bad. So. Then we have Sven on, on the far left side, Dr. Sven Harmsen. Uh, he's a, a corporate finance advisor with Baird International. He's been with uh, Drücker and uh, Leonardo uh, before he joined Baird. He's a very experienced uh, M&A practitioner. He, he works a lot for private equity, but also for strategic sponsors. And, and I'm curious to hear what he will tell us about his perception of the market. And last but not least, uh, Stefan, Stefan Maza from uh, Equistone. Um, one of the biggest or maybe even the biggest uh, private equity fund in Germany. They're currently with their sixth fund uh, that you've just closed in early, earlier this year with 2.8 billion uh, euros, 40 companies in your portfolio, 35 professionals and deal sizes between 50 and 500 million euros enterprise um, value. Stefan heads the team that invests in the uh, German-speaking countries, so Austria, Germany, Switzerland and his focus is on uh, uh, leverage buyouts, management buyouts, and he's uh, our representative for larger, ca a big dinosaur, so large cap Slightly larger. deals. Well, um, if I may, Stefan, uh, I'd be curious to hear from you, um, how, how, went, how did fundraising go for your new fund? Amazing. We raised the fund in a relatively short time. Um, we had a similar experience a couple of years ago with our fifth fund and I think we're not the only ones in the market who have this experience. I think as of today, in the moment you have a fairly good performance, um, the fundraising is not such a big issue. I think it's much more important to um, define what is your strategy going forward. Um, you shouldn't take maybe all the money you could theoretically get because this will put you under pressure. So I think as regards money in the market, this is not the issue right now. Might become it in the future, but for the time being, um, I think the fundraising um, sentiment is very positive throughout all markets. So in, is it the same in investor base that you uh, had previously seen in, in your other funds? Is it still, say, the, the usual suspects, uh, pension uh, funds or uh, insurance companies? Yes. 
It is the usual suspect we have since the beginning of our activities with our first funds in 2002. Um, we have roughly 80% of those investors are the same. Um, we try to develop the funds always from a strategic point of view into certain regions where we would like to have um, investors. Maybe also to spread the investors to reduce risk, to be dependent on a single investor. So this is why maybe a little bit is changing, yes. But um, luckily, and we knock on wood every day, um, luckily our investor basis is quite stable and um, we, f we feel quite comfortable with that. So the, I understand they're standing in line to invest at uh, Equistone, and uh, which is, I mean, good news for you, and uh, that's certainly because you've performed very, very well in the past. But what, what about return expectations? So they come to you, say, can I, can I invest? And tell me, yes, of course, uh, you've been an investor in our previous fund. Do you can can you still promise them the same expect uh, the the same return on their investment as you could? or the previous fund or the fund before that? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say they, they stand always in line. They are definitely very diligent in what they do. And if I see over the years how, how they developed, the, the diligence efforts became more and more professional. So this is definitely, on the one side you have the money, but on the other side you have the, to show them every day the performance and what you do maybe today more than in the past. And um, so this is why they are there, but they would like to see what you do, how you do it, how your team looks like, what is your expectation for the future. So it's maybe what I said before sounds a little bit too easy. It's still work to do. You still have to show them something, but the money is there if you, if you do the right thing. Mm -hmm. As regards return expectations, um, we, yes, we do promise them the same um, returns um, uh, as we had in the past, but it's also no secret the market is more challenging. If in the moment there's more money, it means there's pressure on the margins. I think that, again, looking at the development over the last 15 years or so, in the, whoever in the past focused on leverage and financial engineering only or a multiple arbitrage will find it hard today to achieve reasonable res uh, returns. In the moment, you had a slightly different strategy in the past. You look more into really a value creation in the companies, how do you develop the companies, how do you approach the markets, what else you can do, so do you think a little bit out of, of the box, then you're sustainable, also today. Mm -hmm. But whoever had the, the easy way in the past, as I said, to focus only on financials, financial engineering and on um, arbitrage in the multiple, this is not a winning strategy from our point of view. So it has become more difficult. Uh, these, more challenging. these days, more challenging, more challenging, more challenging. let's put it that way. Gino, do, do you share that view? How was, how, how was fundraising with uh, Afinum's yes, latest funds? I absolutely share uh, St uh, Stefan's view. For us, it was also, we always have re-ups of 85% to 90%. We have a very fidel investor space. Uh, but what we uh, experienced with our last fundraising was that more, let's say, um, German invest investors came on board and talking to fundraising agents, they supported this uh, trend in the whole market, so it was not only typical for our fundraising, and it shows that the pension funds, the German ones or the European ones, or the Versorgungswerke, they are allocating more money to private equity. And in my view forward, I think uh, it will come more and more from the European ones. The Americans did it already over the, over the last five to eight years, but the, now the Europeans or Germans are jumping on board increasing the allocation to private equity. So the inflow will be, I think, steady over the next years. So that's quite good news, but how, how about return expectations? I mean, they come to you because they think if they invest in a phenom, as in the past, they will get good returns. Is it more challenging now to, to actually get those returns? And w can I ask, what do you promise them? <laughs> Typically, we don't promise, we plan. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so in, in the end, I mean, all the investors know that there's a pressure on the margins. And in the end, uh, returns will come down and returns are always relative also to other asset classes. So they must come down. So in the end, we plan for the returns as in the past. But frankly speaking, uh, every investor and I think every GP knows, not only being in fundraising mode, that returns will come down in, yeah. in the industry. As a, I took away at some point that uh, as a rule of thumb, you can say an investor would expect that he gets his money uh, back two times. And then at some uh, point, your carry will kick in. 
Um, I'd be curious to, to hear if the challenging market environment and the, the fact that it has become more challenging to actually get those returns, does that have an impact on, on personnel, on, on brain? Is there a brain drain because people uh, are skeptical if they will get a carry that has the same size as it used to have in the past? Stefan? I don't see that. No. I think um, the overall package, especially for the joiners, is still very attractive. Yeah. Maybe if you joined 10, 15, 20 years ago, the, the outlook was a little bit more, uh, a little bit better or more promising on the one side. But as of today, the industry itself, it's much more stable. And uh, we just heard that there are, even now in Germany, um, more traditional investors who never touched private equity in the past. And they, now they are also in the picture. So you have a much more stable industry. And as we all know, there is a kind of correlation between risk and return. So on the one side, there's, for the new joiners, less risk because the industry is well established and um, very stable. And of course, if there are more players in the markets, um, the margins get a bit squeezed. But I think um, for new joiners, it's still very attractive to go into this industry. And um, because this margin squeeze is not only in private equity, you have it in many industries. So um, I, uh, we, we don't see that there's a brain drain or anything like that. Great. How about, how about you? Do you, do you? Can you attra uh, attract enough talent? Yep. Uh, I think uh, the attraction into the industry is high enough, uh, still very high. Uh, however, I think the industry will a little bit adapt uh, regarding terms and conditions, what, what they offer. Uh, but I uh, fully support this, uh, what Stefan is saying. There's still more to come in the private equity industry because if you look at the moment, if you look at the business cycle, if you look at the stock exchanges, it's somehow leveling out. And if you look there, that uh, many of the, uh, the fund managers then put money into private equity because the stock market, I think, has seen... Uh, its highs, and so in the end, more money will come in, and also more, more talent, and also exiting to private equity companies is, uh, let's say, a, an exit road, which is becoming more and more um, uh, popular. If you look at the IPOs, if you look at the high times, how many IPOs have been done on a worldwide basis, and if you compare it to today's numbers, despite all internet startups that go uh, to the stock exchange and IPO there, it's still uh, going down. So in the end, uh, the exit to PEs, which also then drives the industry, uh, will go on. So, so that's, that's good news for the industry, hopefully. So we've got 2.8 si billion sitting here, 400 million sitting there. That's 3.2 billion. If you leverage that at 50%, we are talking about 6.4 billion investment volume on this table only. So when uh, 6.4 billion investment on this small table over a period of a few years. What does that tell us about the market at the moment? What's your perception of the market? Well, it continues to be a seller's market. <laughs> it's, it's great, a great opportunity for everyone who is considering selling a company. It's not so good for the ones who are in competition trying to win an auction. Um, so we've seen over the last couple of years deal incentives go up. We've seen multiples go up by probably on average a half to one turn by year, which obviously impacts return expectations, um, which impacts potential to gain additional or create additional value for multiple arbitrage. We've seen that some of the investors actually calculated the other way around, assuming a sort of reversion to the mean over the investment period, which obviously then limits their ability to pay up in an auction. Um, we see ample funding available from banks. However, a little bit more on a, on a digital side. So you have strong interest both on the financing and the private equity side for very good assets. It significantly comes down when there are certain tweaks to the, um, to the asset which are easier to understand or accept both on the equity story, and hence the private equity side, or the financing side. And then it usually comes down to less than a handful of players that really engage if an asset is a bit more difficult in terms of the development story. So if you look at the market, would you consider it to be overheated? Is there, is there 
would you think there is too much heat in the room? I mean, there are people who are doing yoga in a, in a sauna. Are we doing transactions in a sauna and then somebody will open the door and, and uh, the, the hot air will go out? Well, you frequently use the, um, the frog and the, and the, uh, the boiling plate example. <laughs> Obviously, it's gone, gone up over a number of years and everyone is used to the story that the prices always go up. Um, on the other hand, when you really look at the, the end game and some of the auctions, there are few players there with very particular angles um, who then pay up and usually pay more or less everything that they have in their pockets. Um, but it's not that you have five people starting a bidding wars without having sort of a particular angle to that particular investment. Hence, I would be careful to actually calling it overheated. It's certainly heated. Um, but as I said, I would be more worried if I'd see that level of interest and sort of double-digit multiples being paid for the B or C type assets, mm -hmm. which is not the case. Is that your perception in the UK as well, Jessica? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there have been a number of people asking the same question. Is the UK, particularly the mid-market, is it overheated? And um, yeah, I agree with Sven. It's, it's certainly hot. Uh, you know, we've also been seeing asset prices increasing to near record levels over the last 18 months, multiples going up. I think, think in UK mid-market deals last year, the average multiple was topping 11 times. There's just, there is just a huge volume of capital chasing after a relatively limited number of real quality assets, and that's driving prices. It's driving leverage levels. That's being assisted by uh, cheap available debt, which in the UK market is very much being bolstered by the emergence of the credit funds. So we're seeing credit funds coming in and um, backing buyout deals uh, increasingly. Uh, I mean, that it touches on the points that have always been already been raised. So there's a real risk, I think, of, of squeezed returns. People are looking at potential exit multiples being the same as entry, if not lower. Uh, and what, what we're seeing uh, our buyout clients doing is moving much more quickly to making operational changes once they've made the investment. So trying to lock in those easy wins right at the start and, and to try to bank that. That's quite, quite interesting. Uh, I, I heard for the first time a few days ago that actually people would, con when they do their models, think, uh, okay, we're, we're buying now because we have to buy, because simply there's pressure on us. We have a, a, a fund term of, say, 10 plus two years, so we have to invest, so we have to have our models. We know we're paying maybe 10, 12 times, um, but if we're looking at, at an exit in three to five years to come, we will calculate with lower exit multiples. Is that the way uh, you would look at a deal at the moment? So we calculate with lower exit multiples? This is how we look at deals, but not only now, we always did it like that. So um, our assumption was always that we never assume increasing multiples. We rather test the models uh, downwards in terms of um, performance of the company in terms of multiples. Mm -hmm. So we try to get a kind of average, average view on the potential um, returns. And I feel that especially today, it's, it's a kind of must that you test your models downwards. And another piece of, of advice would be, maybe you should not take the entire debt that the bank offers to you. Maybe you should be a little bit more careful on that. Mm -hmm. Don't take what 100%, maybe take 85 or 90%. It doesn't touch your returns so much, but management and yourself will sleep much better in certain moments. So uh, are you very bullish with investments at the moment or are you very careful or is it anywhere in between? I would say it, it's both. We, we always did quite a, quite, a, quite a lot of deals. We continue to do deals. The good thing is because it's, um, maybe I should also that, it's not only about the absolute number of returns. If you're an investor, you look at different criteria. Of course, returns are important, but you look into the risk. So how diversified is the fund? How many investments are carried out by that fund? It's one thing to say, I achieved a return of X with five deals, mm -hmm. or I achieved it with 30 deals, 
spread over various industries and countries. There's a totally different risk profile. The third point is, from an investor point of view, how fast does a team deploy the money? Am I sitting here for five years and paying only fees? Am my money is not working? Or does the team invest fast enough and do it get the cash fast enough back? So the cash profile. So all these things you have to consider. And um, coming back to your, to your question, um, we continue to do deals, but I would say we are a little bit in a lucky position. We do not have to do every deal. What we also do a lot is add-on for existing portfolio businesses. So you invest also as a strategic buyer, so to say, which means you, 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 you open a different angle. So there are various ways to, to, to be not fully dependent on this red race, so to say. You are in the, in the picture, of course, you have to run with them. But they are, depending on how you play it, there are various options to, to move a bit away from this, from this um, red line that everybody follows. So you, you would uh, maybe shift your focus a little bit on your existing portfolio, see where you can do add-on acquisitions, is that...? Well, this is, this is always part of the strategy, yeah. but maybe you focus a bit more on that, or if you think you're in processes where it's too hot, you, you don't continue. And there are always opportunities where the processes are not run by a professional M&A um, house like, like Sven does, but sometimes you meet also for smaller companies the auditor of the company who doesn't approach many people but only two or three people because the vendor of the company, the sellers, they, they're not able to handle a process so they just want to have two or three names that are reliable and 5% purchase price up or down doesn't matter. So you have to be able to have those contacts, not only to Sven and his friends, but also to other people who open your doors to smaller deals, to more privately led uh, transactions. So there you get always good deals out of that. So deal sourcing really is, is, uh, has become more and more key Absolutely. Uh, for, for your success. I think key sourcing is, uh, is a value add um, if you're on the PE side. Yeah. And paying a lot is easy. Everybody pay, can pay a lot. And everybody says, I didn't pay too much. So at the end, you know it, at the exit, if it was too much or not. So it's also part of the game to find the right deals and maybe you have the right network to find the right deals. How, how do you see that, uh, uh, Gernot? Is that also your perception? Are you very, very bullish in, in buying new companies or are you more focusing on, say, portfolio management? It's uh, having raised a new fund like uh, Stefan and his colleagues. I mean, you have to anticipate that some when there will be a cooling down of the economy maybe a recession. So you have to incorporate it into your uh, investment strategy. So it's for us, it's the same. We don't push for deals. We only do the deals which we think are appropriate. If we look at the market, it comes like uh, Sven was explaining. You have a, the market is divided in two segments, what I always say. The one segment is the very hot segment. That's like everybody is looking for eternal youth. And if a company can promise this to you, they are bidding up to double-digit uh, multipliers. And then there is other orphan industries where uh, there is almost no interest, or only little interest, but the companies are still very attractive. So for building our portfolio, I think we have to be in both of these industries because then it's somehow balanced. Um, and this, I think, is what investors are also looking for. They are not only looking for the top deals which you, where you price yourself up with the others, but there are also industries that are still very attractive, but not so shiny. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, when you see it the first time, you say, this is uh, uh, the lady which I have to take home. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, both. You have to do follow both, and uh, I think then it's a balanced portfolio, and this is what investors are looking for. So it's key how to source assets, and if you have a good asset, then it's uh, easy to sell, and you can sell it for a good price. Sven, how do you do that? You, have a, you look at Equistone's portfolio, there's 40 companies in it. Stefan gives you a call, says, listen, I'm contemplating to sell one of these, and it's a good asset. Uh, I'm sure you've got in your client base a lot of uh, uh, other private equity funds or maybe, maybe strategic investors who, are, who would be interested. Will you have one, two, three front runners that you would say, listen, I think you are the natural buyer, you should, you should have it, let's do a quick deal because you know they can deliver, or would you always go through the auction process? Let me come to that point in a, in a second, maybe just wrap up on the, on the valuation yeah. discussion. 
What we also see is that sort of the mitigating factor with respect to the multiple dilemma is a focus on growth. So if you invest into growth companies, that essentially is a little bit of a risk protection for you if the multiple eventually goes down, but you generate 10, 15% growth year on year. Um, and there is pretty strong private equity interest to invest into these kind of uh, companies. Where there is less private equity interest is in sort of more the dividend yield models, where people take the approach, there isn't much upside in the company, but I can actually get a pretty good recurring cash flow out of it. Um, and sort of there, the private equity universe looking at these kind of companies is significantly smaller. Those are more the ones that sort of have a bit more experience with industrial uh, investments. Um, with respect to approaching a sell side, I'd say it depends. We, we don't really believe in a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we have situations where we've sold companies in one-on-one in -on -one processes um, as well as broad auctions. We believe that competition is always critical in order to maximize value, um, but also achieve good so other commercial terms um, as well as legal terms. And well, Jessica can comment on that, sort of how competitive momentum can work in SPA <laughs> negotiations. <laughs> Stefan and I have uh, witnessed it as well. Um, obviously preferable if you sell a company you want to have sort of the most amount of money but also a clean exit so no warranty claims afterwards um, there are situations where there are a couple of natural buyers which then usually are strategics and we find that there are situations where it's difficult to include these natural strategic buyers in a broader process so it makes sense to give them a little bit of a of a head start and access to the company. However, we believe there always needs to be a disciplining factor, so it should be accompanied by some sort of process preparation so that if the strategic is very slow or doesn't deliver or drops price, that you always have sort of the plan B available to pull in some more alternative buyers. Um, we sometimes see that on the private equity front as well, but then I think it's critical to really understand the individual rationale why a fund would be prepared and positioned to pay a significantly higher price um, in a non-process um, compared to, um, to, to running a potentially limited auction. Um, so for us, this also comes down to preparation. If you want to sell a company with a limited risk profile, being prepared on the legal, on the financial, on the commercial, on the tech side, helps to identify the key risk points early on, potentially resolve them, and then have a fast, focused exit process with one party or more parties. But we believe in no surprises, both for the shareholders that are selling as well as the buyers. That really helps in maximizing competitive tension and then achieving a great outcome, both of the price and also the SPA in commercial terms. Yeah, I, I share your view. I think proper preparation is, is key for, for a good exit. And that's what we tell our clients is, uh, what do you think about when you can't sleep at night and, and tackle this problem before you go to the market with your company? Um, but Jessica, we're, we're always looking a little bit at the UK because in, in our experience, the, uh, the, the English or the British um, are slightly ahead of uh, how they handle auctions, how they handle processes, what they, what they write into their share purchase agreements. So I'd be curious to hear if you see any changes in auction processes because uh, what we've seen in Germany is uh, we've seen structured processes, but we've also seen people jumping the queue. They, they would call us on Monday and say, here we are, um, I'm here with my team from wherever, I want this company, it's up for sale, and I, will si and I want to sign on Friday. I hate these people because I get paid by the hour if I only have <laughs> one week to work on a deal, that is not fair. Um, but what's the situation in, in England? Do, do you see similar developments? Uh, we do, and funnily enough, when Sven was talking there, I just wrote down here preemption, because that's absolutely what we're seeing at the moment in the market. Um, it's a seller's market in the UK, uh, a lot of assets are going to auction processes. So even where houses have been tracking a particular asset for a couple of years, know the team well, um, 
you know, five, six years ago, they might have had some expectation that they would have been able to secure a proprietary deal. I think, given the current market conditions, those assets, you know, we are seeing some sort of competitive process around them. Uh, and uh, to pick up on, I think, a point that, that Stefan made earlier, we're seeing, because it's so competitive, the, the houses that are participating really do need to have an angle. Uh, the processes are being run more quickly than perhaps they were a couple of years ago, so we're expecting bidders to get up to, up to speed to have done their commercial due diligence in a, in a much shorter time period, and that means bidders must be better prepared. You know, they must have spent the last 12 months or so really understanding the sector, uh, and we're certainly getting a lot of bidders coming forward uh, seeking to preempt the process, saying um, usually at the end of round one, Right, we'll put in our indicative offer um, and we can do this deal in the next 10 days. You also get paid by the hour, right? That's yeah. unfair. <laughs> 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 right, so it's, uh, we're on the, on the, there's a fine line between competition and despair, uh, if I can say that very provocatively. Um, but looking at competition, I mean, we, we see private equity houses, we see strategic investors, and mm -hmm. Sven, that's another question to you. Does private equity win out against strategic investors in, in your perception? I remember that from former, the former days, and that's like five years ago, uh, we would rather see strategic investors at, as, at an advantage because they would pay higher prices, because they could hold the, the asset longer, they would have synergies, and, but we see this advantage being eaten up by the high valuations, and in my perception it would be uh, that private equity is now uh, at an advantage over strategic buyers. Is that too general a statement? Um, probably yes. I would see it more sort of on a by company or maybe by sector basis. Um, in my view, a strategic can always outpay a private equity player um, because private equity by nature will not have synergies. And if a strategic is listed on the stock market, capital is easily available to them as well. Um, they're being confronted with relatively low return expectations currently, need to deliver growth, being faced with a macro environment where they can maybe deliver three, four, five percent organic growth. So mo for most of the strategics, M&A is a key element of the growth strategy. And hence, when they have identified an asset which is sort of top of their add-on list, they're usually very keen. Um, and we have seen that they play along the lines of a private equity player, accepting limited warranties or warranty indemnity insurance. We have a few years ago worked for a US strategic buying a UK company, and in order to be competitive with the private equity universe, they um, came up with a synthetic exit options concept, where they essentially gave the management team the same economics that they had had if they had sold to private equity. Wow. And, and usually being a bit more independent on the governance side and having sort of a very entrepreneurial incentive scheme is what's really interesting for the management teams <coughs> in terms of, of going to private equity. So being able to include that into a strategic offer package um, helps them to be competitive uh, as well. Um, there are other companies where there is sort of no natural consolidator where I'd say by nature private equity is very well positioned uh, because any strategic buyer that might be interested in the asset sort of is more looking at it as a sort of an adjacent, as a new platform, which then usually rather comes with dissynergies in terms of corporate overhead than actual synergies. Mm -hmm. So we would say um, there are companies where there is likely very strong strategic interest and it's hard for private equity to be competitive. Um, as we've also seen strategics at times being very fast. Um, there are others where certainly it's, it's always certain that it's going to be a private equity outcome. Let, we'll talk about synthetic exits um, in, in a moment, but I'd be curious to hear, Sven, do you see uh, non-EU buyers? We see a lot of investors coming from, from Asia, not so much from uh, the US, but a lot from China, who are, who are uh, arriving in Europe or in Germany, and they have a lot of money, they have learned their lessons. Uh, they can be very quick, very professional. Is that also your perception? 
Um, let me start with the US. We have a sizable US sponsor coverage group and for a large number of the private equity players in the US that we are covering, investing into Europe is a key theme. However, investing into Europe for a US player usually means we start in the UK uh, because just culturally, legally, everything else, it's more similar. And then doing the step into Germany is certainly significantly larger. Um, but yes, we're seeing them more and more often. We see sort of players appearing here in the mix which uh, none of the local private equity players had on the radar screen. With respect to China, I'd say the reality is behind the perception. I mean, we've all seen the articles um, about Chinese investors and Chinese corporates buying Germany. We don't think that has happened. Um, and uh, a large number of the Chinese players just still lacks the experience to compete in an auction process. Um, however, as we see the combination of Chinese private equity partnering with Chinese strategics, um, buying German companies or European companies in general, these Chinese private equity firms sort of also take the role of a Chinese M&A advisor, sort of helping the strategic to understand the cultural specifics, the deal specifics um, in Germany and helping them to win. And, and this is certainly a trend which is becoming more and more significant. However, um, this also for specific cases where there is a strategic interest out of China to invest into these sectors. Um, and there is a designated player that wants to grow in sort of a couple of sectors, uh, being it semiconductors or water or other opportunities. Is that similar in the UK? Do you see non-European investors a lot or more than you used to? Certainly more than we used to. I think um, so like five, six years ago, in UK mid-market processes, we'd see the same UK buyout houses time and time again. And I think the last couple of years, um, driven in large part, I'm sure, by the currency fluctuations, we've seen an increasing number of overseas investors becoming more interested in UK mid-market assets than perhaps they might have been previously. So a UK mid-market auction will now typically have um, at least one US um, investor, probably Canadian, um, we see a little bit of Chinese interest, but actually not, you know, not so much. Um, although, where we have seen Chinese bidders recently, um, actually they're, they're becoming much more sophisticated in terms of how to participate in Western auction processes. And I think maybe a few years ago they were um, slightly slower in terms of their decision-making process. Now, actually, I had one earlier this year where the Chinese bidder preempted. Um, to a very very aggressive timetable, and there was you know there were some questions about whether they would hit it, but they you know they absolutely did. So I think that they are you know they are understanding the the, the process much much better now. But yes, we're absolutely seeing overseas investors coming in, and and that's making the deal doing from my perspective um, a bit more interesting because again a few years ago, you know you were dealing with the same participants. You sort of knew everyone knew what the deal terms were. Everyone. And pretty much accepted the position on reps and warranties and you know caps on liability, general disclosure of the data room on what the management equity package is going to look like. And now we've got uh, bidders coming to the table with um, different expectations. And so we're having discussions with them that perhaps we wouldn't have been having uh, a number of years ago. And that you know that makes life for lawyers a bit more interesting. <laughs> More hours. More hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the other thing I think that is an interesting feature of the market that, that we've been seeing is more longer term investors. So patient capital is something that is a phrase that you know, we hear a lot about nowadays. Um, so family offices, sovereign wealth funds, um, institutional asset managers, so pension funds and insurers who have historically done co-invests alongside buyout houses, but who are now building direct investment teams within the insurer, within the, 
uh, within the pension fund. And certainly in the UK, they've been going out to UK buyout houses and recruiting that in-house experience. So they're coming in and participating directly in these auctions. And then there's the larger buyout houses like, um, like CBC and, and KKR who've, who've set up longer hold funds. And that, again, changes the dynamics of some of these deals. It changes the capital structure because those longer hold funds have a different return profile. Um, and from a management perspective, it, it changes the, the um, profile around the management incentive plan. So traditional, traditional PE uh, was relatively straightforward. So the interest of the investors very much is aligned with the, the interests of the management team. Everyone's working together to achieve a capital return within four to five years. The longer hold capital funds don't necessarily have to drive an exit within five years. They may well be happy to sit there for eight, ten years and just take dividend yield out. And so the challenge there is how do you put in place a share incentive-based plan that's going to motivate your management team, that's going to attract and retain the top talent. Uh, and we've been seeing um, sort of the synthetic liquidity events that Sven mentioned coming increasingly into play in, in these sorts of transactions. So how, how would you structure that? I mean, so there's patient capital, but impatient management. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, want, they want a liquidity event in, say, three to maximum five years. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, certainly within, you know, sort of near term, working life, natural life. So yeah, within sort of five years is typically where you, sort of, you know, they'll have a business plan at the point of investment. The deal is, you know, we will deliver this business plan, but at some point we need to be able to make a capital return. And in the UK, you know, that's sort of particularly important for management teams given the different tax rates. So UK managers will pay either 10% if they uh, get entrepreneur's relief or 20% tax on a capital exit. They'll pay about 38% tax on distributions, dividends. Uh, or 45% tax on employment-related income bonuses. So you can see that they're you know, very much motivated to deliver their returns in a capital form. So there's a number of different ways you can structure liquidity events. Um, I think the two most common ones that we see are put options and share shops. So put option... Uh, works by giving the management team the option to require uh, either an employee benefit trust or a group company to buy their shares at certain points in time uh, at the then market value. Usually uh, the put option exercise is staggered over a number of years, so two, three, four years, um, and typically those options become exercisable after four years, say. Um, there'll be then a valuation exercise. Um, and that, that then allows the company to spread the cost of that option, uh, and it allows an averaging out of valuation. So you don't take the benefit of a particularly good year, or conversely, a, you, know, you don't uh, have to exercise your option after a particularly bad year. Um, so that, I think that's probably the most common way. The other share shops we've seen a number of times as well, and they're quite, they can be useful where you have succession planning um, uh, a focus. So where you have a slightly older management team and you are envisaging over the life of the investment to transition down to an, a new team, then share shops can be quite a good way to achieve that transition. So it allows you to, um, over a, a period of time, allow your senior executives to sell down shares and recycle them amongst the management team. And again, typically you have annual windows when management are permitted to sell up to a certain amount of their shares to other members of the management team. Usually that's backstopped, so if there's no willing buyers, then the company will step in and pick up any excess shares. And from the management perspective, you, you as a manager want to know that there's going to be funds available to uh, support either the exercise of your put option or the share shop. 
So you typically look for protection in the equity documents that says the company must set aside certain amounts of funds each year to satisfy its obligations to fund put options or, or share shops. We sometimes see restrictions on distributions that can be made to the sponsors. Um, as, a, as a backstop, sometimes we see managers being entitled to receive loan notes if there is not sufficient cash available, and those loan notes then rank ahead of the uh, sponsor returns until the point at which they're repaid. So there's a number of different ways that you can, you can deal with this depending on the circumstances of the particular deal. Um, and funnily enough, we've, we've seen share shops also being used not in a long-term capital situation uh, where we had a US, you know, traditional US buyout house, but where they were asking the management team to roll over more than the management team was comfortable rolling over. So in that case, we had a management team who'd been promised an exit for 10 years. They'd been desperately waiting for an IPO that had never arrived. Uh, they had the opportunity to make some money and they were keen to take cash off the table. And the buyout house said, well, we understand that, but actually we'd like you to roll over you know, more than 50%. And so the compromise that was struck to bridge that gap was a share shop to allow them to uh, realize some of that rollover earlier than they might otherwise have done. Well, that's uh, quite exciting. So it, it appears that what, what you would call patient capital, they're doing their homework in mm. uh, terms of incentivizing the right management team. So they get uh, very competitive to private equity sponsors because they can offer the same or very similar terms now. Um, Gernot, is, is that uh, patient capital, is that a competitor when you invest? Um, in, s in certain situations it is, uh, but now in relation to management uh, terms uh, and conditions what they have in the management package, I would say it's not very present in our segment, in the smaller mid-market segment. Um, we have still the situation there that the, it has become more professional with the managers that they say, I want a participation in the company, I want uh, an incentive scheme. But still in the smaller mid-market segment, we still have bonus or big company cars that are more appealing than shares. And the most expensive we can give away is shares. So uh, it's for us still a mix. It has become more professional. They are negotiating. They are very well advised. Uh, <laughs> my colleagues like, <laughs> uh, like Jessica. Um, but it's still more the question, do you get the right talent to the right site? For us, what we see is uh, with the managers in earlier times when, we start, when I started uh, working in buyout business, it was not a question where is the company located which you are buying. You found a young person that said, I go there, I do the management and then for the five years we sell. Today, for example, location has become a very important uh, point if you find good talent. There are very good companies which are located more remote, but it's very difficult to get good talent to these sites because uh, you often you have double income couples, it's not so easy to move the people there and we are not uh, promoters of the fly-in and fly-out management. For us, we think it's very important that the people are there, that they do their work there. Um, and so for us, the, and we are also working almost at full employment here in, in Germany, so for us, uh, the major thing is, or the, the, the major uh, challenge is to find the right people and uh, to right, find the right fitting people also for remote places. So for us, often it's, it's a question when we buy a company which is located more remotely, uh, that we decide and say, maybe we, um, we, um, we take out the administration and put the administration to a, a location where we can find the talent. So we move part of the company to where the talent is sitting which we did with one company where Frank was advising the seller. <laughs> uh, we moved the company where the talent is. So this is uh, for us the major task because in the end, the company evolves as good as the management is. That's how it is. So same strategy for you probably. It's, it's a bit different because um, usually we only look into companies that have an existing stable management. We do not bring our own managers. So that's part in our due diligence to be very diligent, very careful about the management team. Um, for us, it's a must that managers participate at, so to say, preferred conditions in the um, 
um, in the shareholding. That's a must for us. But what we do not um, look at are companies with, uh, which require a change of management. This may happen, I mean, you're not always right, so in a few occasions over uh, the last um, 15 or 20 years we had to change management, but very, very seldom. Um, so um, we don't see this at the top level of the management, the, the, uh, the lack of, of, of people, but we see this definitely in the second and third layer at least, where when you increase your, um, uh, uh, your production, when you build up your production, um, when you grow, you need more people, and um, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big thing. It's very difficult to find the well-qualified people in such a growth scenario. In, in, a, in a very competitive environment, has, in your view, the, the role of your advisors, has that changed? Do you, look for, do you look at advisors differently than you did a couple of years ago? Do you want them to be more, say, specialized or uh, any other qualities? Sector knowledge, or well, the advisors on the commercial side, you always want sector knowledge. This has not changed. Um, if, if at all, we um, we do look a little bit more into operations than we did in the past. So we are considering maybe to have somebody who has a bit more background on operations. But overall, I would say that, as I mentioned earlier, if in the past you only focused on financial engineering and multiple arbitrage, then you have a problem today. If you did not do that in the past, if you had already a value creation strategy in the past, then you continue like that. Mm -hmm. So there are slight changes for us as Equistone, but not in the overall picture. It's not a big thing. So we continue as we did in the past, and we're just here or there a little bit. Mm -hmm. What's your perception on, on the requests from Stefan and his friends? to advisors? I'd say very hands-on. Um, Equistone tends to work with small teams, well integrated and short communication. And I think that also goes hand in hand with sort of how you manage and how you work with advisors. So yeah. I think you're looking for hands-on people, small teams that can sort of drive things forward instead of uh, lots of hierarchies. There's one particular reason I'm asking this question, because I heard when we prepared for this panel that uh, UK lawyers start to advise on German deals. <laughs> 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 That's uh, unheard of. <laughs> um, we've, I mean, I think we, <laughs> we work regularly with uh, firms in other jurisdictions, so McParlin's practices law, and um, we've got one office in London, we practice in, in the UK only. So what we do a lot is partner with firms in other jurisdictions uh, to advise on uh, cross-border transactions. And the, the transaction that Frank is referring to there is where we recently advised a German corporate who was investing um, alongside a large LBO house and they used their German advisors to, who knew them very, very well, knew their structure very well, to sort of lead on the documents, but we were brought in to give them some private equity background and sort of oversight as to what the current market was and market terms. Um, but we're very used to working you know, very closely with our friends and colleagues across the continent. Quite interesting. So. <laughs> Uh, we're already over the time, but I think we should allow for a few questions from the audience. I mean, we certainly have another five minutes if any of you would have questions. And also on um, what, what, uh, what uh, your investors, your GP, uh, are asking about uh, um, distribution you're getting. Because that's something we see as... I'm a legal advisor like Frank. So. Um, I think those are discussions you always have. You always had in the past, you still have. Maybe the discussions are more intense, yes. Um, but again, I think as long as you're performing well, you have a lot of arguments on your side. It's a kind of trade-off for the investors on the one side. Yes, you discuss fees. On the other side, they also want to have a team which is well incentivized and delivers good results. So. Um, I think it's really, it depends on your performance. Yeah.
Other questions? Yes. I have one more question, um, and it again goes to you, Jessica. <laughs> W&I insurance. Mm. Uh, I think we all agree that in a private equity transaction these days, W&I insurance is, is standard. You would just expect a buyer to take out W&I insurance, <coughs> and as a seller, you want to be liable for one euro. Now, I think that, to me, seems to be the case in probably 90% of the PE transactions that I do. But I would, what I heard the other day is that in the UK, and again, you're probably um, advanced compared to mainland Europe, you could talk to your insurance company and for an extra premium, you can buy away materiality. So, or you can buy away a knowledge qualifier mm. so that the warranties will read vis-a-vis -vis the insurance company as if there was no materiality qualifier, no knowledge qualifier. It will be absolute warranties. I, is that right? Yeah, it's been certain that is the case in relation to knowledge qualifiers. So in UK transactions, it's now pretty standard for all warranties to be, to be qualified by management's awareness. And when you put in place a W9 policy, one of the benefits of that is that you can apply what we call a knowledge scrape. So for the purposes of the policy, the knowledge qualifier won't apply to the warranties. Now, typically, the insurers will say there are certain warranties that we do want the knowledge qualifier to apply to, um, but they'll go through and they'll pick them out one by one. That does cost a, a little bit more, um, but that is, that is relatively common now. Um, in terms of materiality, again, you can, we, we see that less frequently, but you can certainly, if you are the buyer who's taking out the policy, you can certainly sit down with your insurer and, and work out which of the warranties you want to amend for the purposes of the policy to either you know, extend, uh, typically, your coverage. Well, that's, that, that shifts the risk <coughs> in an M&A transaction very significantly. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I mean, and the, the W&I insurers have got a very sophisticated product now. They, they are you know, experienced in doing these kind of deals. They've got teams of lawyers who they've recruited from firms like McFarland's and other city firms who are used to doing private equity transactions, who are very familiar with warranty schedules, disclosure letters, due diligence. Um, and they, can, you know, they understand the risk profile pretty well. Maybe one question from my side regarding this insurance. Um, since the UK is further down the road, are there already some litigations where these uh, insurance companies are then involved? And how, this, how does this then work? Yeah, so there, there have been. Um, there's not, there haven't been that many yet. Mm -hmm. So I'd say the insurance market we first started seeing it in around sort of 2008, 2009, when um, the, the prices went right down and management teams started saying, well, hang on a minute, we're not getting anything out of this deal, so you know, why, or not very much, so why should we put all of our proceeds on the line? And that's really when we started to see the W&I solution coming in, um, and it's now being used because it's such a seller-friendly market. So to answer your question, yes, there, there have been claims out there. Uh, Typically, the, the insurers have been paying up. They're normally claims around the accounts warranties. Won't surprise you to hear. Um, what will be interesting is over the next three years, how many more claims come out and what that does to the premium. Because at the moment, premiums are very low. So the market is very soft. It's cheap to put in place these policies. So why wouldn't you? Um, but if we do start seeing a slew of claims coming out, we might see the, the insurers retrenching a bit. Mm. So we'll be curious to see how that develops yeah. over the next 12 months when you hopefully will be sitting here again and we'll <laughs> just to hear how things develop in the UK so we can copy it. <laughs> 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 no, Jessica, thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you, thank you very much um, for this panel. Thanks. Mm -hmm.